hear a little bit more on an ongoing basis about what the organization is doing, what we're up to, what we're grappling with, what kind of resources we have available, uh, what activities we've been uh, engaging in, and things that are on the horizon for us. Um, give you an opportunity to ask us questions, give us feedback, give us ideas, um, both uh, to me as I'm standing here through a QA, and a which is going to follow the presentation, and then afterwards as we uh, just sort of mix and mingle and eat and drink, talking to me or any one of the staff um, who all have different areas of sort of expertise and focus. Um, and I'm going to start off actually by just introducing the staff, uh, all of which except one are here tonight. Um, actually, Sarah Bean Hackman, who some of you know particularly the deal with landmarking issues, she's at Community Board 2 tonight um, dealing with uh, some landmarks applications we will be talking about. So she couldn't be here, but everybody else is. So uh, Sam Moskowitz, who's our Director of Operations. Hello. Um, Hello. Back. Um, as, Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> as I explained, <laughs>
even know yet, which is a, a, amazing that this has not been done by the powers that be, how many air rights this act of the state legislature enables potentially to move in. Estimates that the trust have put forward is as much as a million and a half uh, square feet. That's a beautiful amount of statement about a price where buildings were of development. So that means that's how much more development potentially we could get here on top of what the existing zoning already was. And you could get zoned, we could get development here without any of those air rights being moved uh, whatsoever. And in fact, we did a little um, uh, exercise showing what if those air rights were moved uh, inland to this area, we might see happening along our waterfront from the meatpacking district um, all the way down to uh, uh, Houston Street and below. Um, we're also very worried because there are, while the proposed development is mostly surrounded by commercial, relatively densely built up area, the Hudson Square area, which has those big old loft buildings, not that far away is um, parts of the South Village, which we have been trying to get landmark for many, many, many years. This is Houston Street here. This is uh, 6th Avenue. This is Watt Street down here. This is West Broadway. As many of you know, for about 10 years, we've been waging a campaign to get the South Village landmark. Much of the area to the north up here, going all the way up to Washington Square, we got landmarked in 2013. And then this part over here, which basically would be west of six, between 6th and 7th Avenues, between Houston Street and West 4th Street, most of that we got landmarked in 2010. So we've been making incredible progress, but uh, this we really have to force the city to landmark, and we are trying to similarly force them to landmark this area as well as part of this process. And this just sort of shows you, so again, this is Houston Street here, this is um, Sullivan and Thompson Street. Under the existing zone, without landmark protections, that's what could be built right now in the <coughs> South Village, a 300-foot tall tower. And we do not want to see this happen. Um, so this brings us to what our demands are, and this is actually a picture from the recent hearing of the City Planning Commission in August, which several people in the room um, attended, and we're very grateful for that, and of course, uh, scheduled it for the dead of August. Um, we are insisting that if the approvals aren't given for this rezoning, um, and again, keep in mind, even if no approvals are given, something big and monstrous could and probably would be built on that site, we are insisting that they have to finally move ahead with that final phase of the South Bridge landmark in which an area that's nearby, that's low rise, that's residential, that's definitely threatened. We want to make it so this uh, project would include moving 200,000 square feet of air rights from Pier 40 to the St. John's building as a way of paying for the repairs to Pier 40. As many of you know, Pier 40 was damaged by Hurricane Sandy, and even before that, it was sort of in bad shape. Um, and there's a, a danger that all the parking spaces there, which generate income for the park, and the ball fields and playing fields could be shut down in the not too distant future. And in fact, there is a very large constituency of people in our neighborhood who are pushing very hard for this to be approved as it is without any of these requirements attached to it. Um, because their primary concern is making sure that those ball fields and playing fields, that a lot of children and families depend upon, are not lost or shut down. Um, so what we're demanding is that if they do that, in this case, if they transfer those air rights, that they then put a bid on any further future air rights transfers anywhere in our neighborhood. So that though we would get 200,000 square feet of air rights transfers to this one site, uh, the St. John site, we would never get any more again anywhere in Greenwich Village. And without that, even if this is not approved, that million and a half square feet of air rights could come into our neighborhood at any time in the future. So that would be a significant, significant benefit uh, to be able to prevent that from ever happening. And then finally, the way this um, large development is currently planned, it would have a um, very, very large um, big box retail component. You know what big box is? It's like a, a you know, Target, uh, a Lowe's, you know, one of those very, 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 very large stores that drive to and take a huge amounts of space away from. Um, they also wanted to include a large amount of what they call destination retail, which by its definition means that people are coming from far and wide. Um, and if they're going to be coming from far and wide to go shopping at this site, they're not going to be coming by public transportation because the nearest subway is many blocks away. They're going to be coming by car. 
Um, it's near the Holland Tunnel. Um, it's also near what is a, a, an inn, what is an incredibly congested area. Um, so we are demanding that the big box stores and the destination rooms are be eliminated from the plan. Um, that is one thing that we can do that would have a tremendous impact. I don't think that there's anything that we can do that's going to make this um, development discreet, charming, um, low scale, um, but we can have a big impact in terms of the impact that we have on the surrounding area in terms of things like traffic, which this definitely would. So this has enormous consequences. This is going to be decided before, uh, by the end of the year. The ultimate vote comes at the city council. The city council has to approve it, disapprove it, or modify it. We've been working very closely with council member Corey Johnson. He's very aware of and has expressed a great deal of support for our demands, among others that are out there. Um, but it remains to be seen what's going to happen at the end of the day. Um, a recent victory that we had, which we actually just yesterday in our emails that are reported on, uh, which is particularly encouraging because uh, the mayor has been so focused on trying to strip away our zoning protections and then bring in new zoning that's much worse than what he has. We actually had a small but significant victory um, in terms of a proposal to rezone a couple of blocks on uh, East Houston Street, where what would have been done was it was a request by the developer. They would have basically undone a piece of the 2008 rezoning that we and many other community groups fought for to get in the East Village and Lower East Side, the East Development, East Dale, um, uh, and things of that nature. Um, this developer would have changed a small piece of it. Um, the city, the mayor's city planning commission approved it over strong community objections. Where our president was opposed, Councilmember Rosie Mendez expressed a lot of um, uh, uh, reservations about it. We turned out, others turned out at the um, city council hearings. Through our website, we generated a couple of hundred letters to the city council in opposition to it. And at the last minute, the developer withdrew the proposal, which means he knew he was going to lose. So rather than lose, he saved face by just uh, taking out of there. So that was um, great. Um, and uh, these days, we need to savor our victories when we get them because we've actually had some really um, bitter and stinging uh, defeats as well. Also, here in the East Village, and actually just a couple blocks away, this is a row of 19th century Bogus Marks uh, tenements on the south side of 11th Street, just across from Webster Hall. They're unusual in their detailing and how intact they are. Um, they're also unusual because in 2008, as a part of this rezoning process that I uh, just mentioned, the Landmark Preservation Commission did a survey of the neighborhood and said these buildings are eligible for landmark designation. Now that doesn't mean that they get landmark, but it means that the commission kind of has them on their list, uh, so to speak, of places that merit consideration for landmark designation. Sometimes it takes some time for them to get to it because there's a lot of other things going on. Um, well, we became aware that a developer was planning to tear them down and replace them with a hotel. 13 story hotel called the Moxie, which is a sort of a brand of Marriott hotel that's geared towards uh, 20 something folks. And it's more or less supposed to have a kind of party atmosphere to it, just locally. Um, <coughs> um, and, uh, you know, interestingly, these buildings uh, had many long term tenants in them, uh, some of them were in um, rent regulated housing. And the mayor claims that preserving and promoting affordable housing is his number one priority. So we brought this to the attention of the Landmarks Preservation Commission and we said, hey, they haven't filed the demolition permits yet. Let's move in there and uh, get these landmarks before it's too late. And the commission uh, refused to move. Um, the city, it took two months went by. And then finally, the city approved the demolition permits without the LTC taking any action whatsoever. Only after we went to the press to call attention to this did the LPC finally formally respond and write it. And they said, oh, we looked at them and we just don't think they're worthy of landmark designation. No explanation for why in 2008 they looked at them and they thought they were worthy of landmark designation. And now they didn't. Well, and nothing has changed about them physically in that time period. The only thing that's changed about them is the ownership. The owner of the building is now a Lightstone group whose head is uh, a campaign contributor to the mayor, who's been embroiled in a bit of a scandal. There's been a lot of press and publicity about this, about um, a, a contribution that he made that was direct, seemingly at the direction of the mayor. Um, and the mayor recently appointed him to the New York City Economic Development Corporation. So uh, that's the only thing that we know of that's changed. 
changed about these buildings in the last eight years. Certainly nothing physically changed about them. We did have a big demonstration there, which um, did capture a lot of uh, press attention, calling attention to the, the historic nature of the buildings, the potential for affordable housing, um, and the city just got in their guilt and refused. And if you walk by uh, tonight, or if you walk by, you'll notice they're starting interior demolition on the building, which is very, very sad. We're doing some outreach to um, some unions that represent hotel workers because we understand this is going to be built by, it's going to be a non-union hotel. We know, and Harry did some great research on this, that they're using an asbestos uh, abatement uh, of a company that's been known to have um, cheated their workers and has been banned from getting public contracts for that reason. That doesn't make it illegal for them to do this, but it makes it the intentional of who we hire for this. So we're looking for other allies out there in the honor effort. Um, it's another uh, victory, and it's one of those victories that you wouldn't even know it happened because it's preventing something bad from happening. But a developer was is going to tear down this building from the corner of 14th Street and the zoning for that corner, which is a major intersection, you know, directly across the street is a you know, 20 something story, uh, circa 1930s um, uh, office building. Um, the zoning law is a substantial building to be built there. Well, this developer that wasn't satisfied um, and went uh, to the Board of Stamps and Appeals asking for a zoning to build something even bigger than what the zoning would allow, about 20% bigger, claiming that they had a hardship um, because there's uh, subway lines that run underneath them and all this other stuff. Uh, long story short, we were able to um, uh, prevent them from getting a zoning variance that would make the building bigger and taller than what they had originally proposed, which is great. Something's going to be built here, this two-story building of no historic distinction. I don't think too many people will miss that much. Um, but we won't be getting an oversized, supersized building here as the developer had originally um, proposed. Uh, right now, we're very much in the process of um, and working on a proposal for 11 Jean Street, this is between uh, Greenwich Avenue and Hudson Street, where a developer this is in the Greenwich Village Historic District, so it needs landmark approval, is uh, seeking to uh, tear down this building, which the designation report says is a non contributing building, so typically that's allowed, but replace it with a much, much, much larger um, uh, residential building that really looks like an office building. In, in an office park in Denver, DC, anywhere. There's nothing in Greenwich Village, it's in that Greenwich Village Historic District about this. So we've definitely been um, pushing back hard on that. A lot of neighbors, along with us and other people, turned out the landmarks preservation commission hearing on it. Um, they didn't issue a final decision. They expressed some reservations about the proposal. I wish those reservations had been a little more forceful than they were. It remains to be seen. Uh, the ball is basically in the developer's court to come back um, and present a new revised proposal and see if he uh, can get the LPC's um, uh, approval. Um, we'll be there for that and we'll certainly be publicizing it to um, everybody so that others can attend and see what's going on there. That's the sticker we were all wearing at the um, hearing. Um, and then just at the other end of Jane Street, 8589 Jane Street, which is um, Washington and French, yes. um, uh, there's a proposal here to turn two um, uh, very nice 19th, early 20th century low-rise buildings into basically a mega mansion for a very, very, very wealthy individual. Um, the front part of it is much more in keeping uh, with the neighborhood, but there's these 80 and 90 foot tall towers that he wants to erect on the rear part of the site. Um, one in glass, one in concrete, um, that would be sort of a stacked series of um, rooms, a library, uh, some other space there, uh, which we think is outrageous and is not what we want to see um, proliferating in the Greenwich Village Historic District. There, the commission, when they heard it, was more emphatic. Um, indicating that they thought that this was absolutely wrong. Um, we're hoping that that means it will disappear entirely and not come back, not be shortened, just be removed. And we're hoping that uh, a little bit more work can be done on this to make it fit in just right. Um, but here again, the ball is in the developer's court, um, so we will see what happens. Let's take a look at all the answers. There's a lot of folks in the room here who are at that. Um, 
So shifting sort of from advocacy, I want to talk a little bit about our Business of the Month program, which has been going for about, uh, kind of about two years now, maybe two years this fall, I believe, um, which has really been this wonderful opportunity to help publicize, call attention to, hopefully help small businesses uh, in our neighborhood, and Harry uh, there again as well as our point person for that um, when we pick a business uh, once a month, usually from nominations that we receive from the public, so please send in. Um, your favorite local businesses that you would like to be um, highlighted. Um, uh, they get one of these to put on their door. We include them in an article about them in our blog, on our website, in our newsletter. It reaches thousands and thousands of people um, just over the last couple of months. And by the way, everything that we're talking about here is just the last three months. We're not going back any further than that. So you can see we've been very busy. So uh, Catholic Equality uh, is one of our recent selections. We were experiencing some trouble with their landlord. Yes. And some lunch learning problems, so we thought it was particularly um, timely to give them some positive attention. Um, Integral Yoga Institute, which is celebrating their 15th anniversary on 13th Street. We got a lot of nominations for them. They were lovely, lovely people. Um, so we're going to have to do that. And then Exit Nine Gift Emporium on uh, Avenue A in the East Village, um, which if you haven't been in there, it's a really, really fun place. Again, lovely couple owns it, you know, sort of neighborhood folks. Um, so it's a great way to call attention to this sort of stuff. Um, another great way that we are try to call attention to wonderful things in our neighborhood is through our plaque program. Um, and in June, was it June, Henry? Or May? Yes. Okay. This is the all Harry stuff here. Harry was our plaque uh, guy as well. In June, we put a plaque on the former um, studio and residence of uh, John Mich Michel Basquiat um, on Bond Street, and that was a particularly popular um, unveiling ceremony that we had. Um, Harry, do you want to just mention quickly who a couple of the folks were who uh, participated in that? In terms of sure, well, speech? Michael Holman spoke, who was a very uh, prominent figure of that era, and uh, a very, he created the term hip-hop, and he spoke, which was great. Um, there was a young woman from the African Studies Department at NYU that did a uh, Still Fly at 55 conference about Basquiat and his work that also participated. And then Greg Masters, a local poet from the East Village, thanks to Phil Hartman's connection, uh, read a poem too. So we're looking forward to the next one. I hope to see you there. And speaking of the next one, a little bit of a preview, that's going to be a plaque um, marking the uh, former home and studio of Chaim Gross, who was um, a sculptor um, who uh, uh, really has an incredible collection of both his own work and others' work um, that he has preserved in this incredible space on the party place. If you've never been there, you you got to go. It's amazing. You know, you're stepping back in time, you're surrounded by incredible art um, at every turn. Um, it's really amazing. We have a great partnership with the, um, the uh, Gross Foundation, which runs this, um, and this is another way of working with them. Where is it on La Gavaglia? Where is it? Where is it on La Gavaglia? It's on Lafayette Street near Peter uh, Street. Um, it's on La Gavaglia. a uh, little closer to the leader, and we'll be sending something out about that. And it'll be an opportunity not just to have the plaque unveiled, but then for everybody to go inside and to experience this uh, incredible space. So we're really looking forward to that. Speaking of art, one of the things that we've been working on, again, uh, Harry here, uh, you know, the Astor Place, um, Cooper Square, uh, Stuyvesant Street intersection, you know, they've been working on it for uh, seemingly forever now, um, creating some more um, pedestrian and public space there, which is a good thing. We uh, when this process began years ago, there were a few things that we were very insistent uh, that we believe needed to be a part of this. One was that the um, uh, mosaics, which are such a distinctive part of uh, that space created by um, Jim Powers over here, um, they should be preserved. They're an important part of what makes that space and the East Village especially um, so special. We also wanted to make sure that the historic street patterns would still be recognized. <coughs> sort of entirely soon. We also want to make sure that the, the Q uh, comes back for the Alamo, um, its official name, um, and that is still supposed to happen in spite of rumors to the contrary. We will be doing everything we can to make sure that that's the case. Um, but Harris did a lot of work to um, help make sure that Jim was it. So they basically had to remove all of those lampposts and reconstruct them. 
So that meant that a lot of the artwork itself had to be reconstructed, which was a really, really painstaking process. Um, and it was not easy to do. Um, we helped in terms of finding um, a space where Jim could work in order to do that, calling attention to it in terms of needing to raise funds for it, um, and really just doing a lot of sort of liaison to help try to smooth that um, effort. And so um, those, some of them have reappeared already, if I'm not mistaken, is that right? And more should be coming. Um, and there's, we'll talk about this more later, but there's going to be a big festival with that on the island. So shifting to education, another big thing we've been working on over the last couple months and will be in the next few months is our continuing education program, um, which is mostly focused towards people who work in the real estate industry um, who are required by law to do continuing education on a regular basis. Um, and if they're going to do that, we think it's a great opportunity to educate them about the value of preservation. Um, and many of them are very willing participants in that. We actually have some great partnerships with people who work um, in that uh, uh, business. And this is just some examples of our continuing ed program. But we do also often make it open to the public. And it's these wonderful classes about uh, you know, the history of the development of housing in New York, Jane Jacobs' influence, a uh, whole range of things. And Sam there uh, in the back is our point person for our continuing ed program. And I think, Sam, if I'm not mistaken, we had sort of record participation in the one earlier this year. Is that right? Yep, maximum participation. Yeah. And so we're going to be having another one in the fall. We've been doing it twice a year. So um, uh, if it's something you're interested in, definitely uh, keep an eye open for it. And uh, you get a discount if you're a GDSHP member. So it's a great way to um, uh, learn a little bit more. And this past year, we also launched our um, Instagram account. Um, so we're trying to expand our social media presence. We're uh, relatively young and new at that. And Chelsea um, is our coordinator for uh, Instagram and a lot of other communications. Um, so if you don't follow us and you are on Instagram, please do. Please you know, like us, spread the word, etc. But it's just it's a great way to get out there through um, images. Um, really, so many of the things that are so amazing about our neighborhood, much of which is about the actual beauty um, and the things that you can see. So we're really happy about that. We've, though the summer is traditionally a slower time for our programs, these are all the programs we've done just uh, since mid-June. So as you can see, we've been um, incredibly busy. Um, last night we had a huge, not last night, the night before, we had a huge forum um, at uh, NYU with groups from uh, the northern tip of Manhattan to the southern um, about community efforts to um, uh, uh, put forward rezoning plans, which under the current environment and the current mayor has been particularly challenging. Um, we had great uh, haunts of Dylan Thomas walking tour for members only, and since all of you are either members or friends of members, um, a lot of you um, have participated in uh, these, and they're great. They're a great way for um, people who are part of the GDSH family to sort of celebrate in this more intimate way our neighborhood. And as you can see, you know, just lots of great stuff, Jefferson Market, Garden Party, um, LGBT history in the village and beyond, um, celebrating immigrant heritage, uh, this book, um, and um, uh, I don't know how many of you know uh, Daytona in Manhattan, but it's this brilliant, brilliant blog about the history um, of New York, and we have the um, guy behind it, uh, uh, Tim Miller, Tom um, come in and make a great presentation specifically focusing on uh, Greenwich Village. Um, and so here's from the zoning forum last night. We had, uh, we surpassed capacity, but we unfortunately had to turn people away as we often do with our programs. I think we have you know, 120 and how many people are here? 177. Okay, great. Um, and um, uh, this is uh, the tour of uh, Dylan Thomas, which brought us uh, into Patchen Place, which you don't always get um, access to, so that was really particularly nice. Um, and then uh, sort of shifting to some uh, online and material resources. Uh, one of the things that we do, and it's uh, too bad Sarah can't be here tonight, working very hard, um, but Sarah, as our Director of Preservation and Research, helped put together this report that we issued, which um, I think some of you have received uh, hard copies of it, and it's available online to everybody. We documented all of the federal houses, which are um, really the first wave of development that took place in our neighborhood, uh, houses that were built between 1790 and 1835 in this new style of the American Republic. We documented all of the, about 130 of these houses in our neighborhood that we've been able to get landmarked in the last 20 years, either through individual designation or historic district designation. Um, went through each 
each and every one of them. So for instance, looking at the Greenwich Village Historic District Extension number two, which is we refer to as phase one of our South Village Historic Districts. That's how it came about. So in this area between 6th and 7th Avenues, um, there were several dozen of these federal houses that were landmarked as part of that. Show you each and every one, when it was built, when it was altered, all of this uh, great information, which is really just a wonderful uh, resource. And we're now working on, so you're getting a sneak preview of a new report that we hope to issue shortly, doing a survey of all of the new buildings that have been approved in the Greenwich Village Historic District by the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Some of them are ones that we love, some of them are ones that we cannot believe that the Landmarks Preservation Commission approved them. Um, and a lot of them are somewhere in between. Um, but we think it's really important, especially with what you saw recently, what you saw up there in terms of James Street, to be able to have a really overall um, sort of encyclopedic uh, uh, sense of what has or hasn't been allowed in our neighborhood under landmark designation. So when these proposals come forward, we can put them in some sort of context. Um, and I think that, and nobody's done it before, but whether or not the city agencies that are in charge of this have none of this information. So this has actually been a big project and we're really looking forward to it coming to fruition. Um, another thing that we uh, have been doing a lot of work on, and this is what Sarah is doing right now, is every single application to change a landmark building in our neighborhood that rises to the level of requiring a public hearing and anything other than my work should rise to that level, we review it, we put it up on our website, we go to each of the hearings, if we think it's warranted, we testify, we alert the public, we let the public know how you can weigh in on it, you see what the application is. Uh, the summer is a very slow time for this because the Landmarks Preservation Commission actually doesn't meet as often uh, during the summer as they do during the rest of the year. And so even just in the last uh, three months, there's been 21 of these applications that we've um, reviewed one by one. Um, and they can be everything from a new building in NoHo, um, which this is not the version of it that was uh, approved. Um, but this was the original version they submitted to uh, a restoration of a new townhouse on uh, West 10th Street um, and everything uh, in between. And this is the fabric of our neighborhood, so it's really incredibly important that we go over each one of these uh, meticulously with a fine tooth comb and let the public know about it because we frequently hear from people that say, look, I'm in a landmark district and I see that my neighbor next door is doing this, how could they do it? Typically, there's a process that they're going through, and it's important that you know what that process is and that you know that you have an opportunity to have a voice in that process um, to either object or support or something in between um, uh, because it's often very difficult to know um, what these things are and what's happening. Um, similar to that, one of the things that we do is we, uh, we look for, we keep our eyes open for, and we receive complaints about what appear to be violations um, of either landmark rules or zoning rules. And here's one that we just reported on yesterday in our uh, email newsletter that's sort of an iconic site in uh, the Meatpacking District, which in 2003 we uh, successfully got a landmark. So this is one for many years has served at was Florence, which was, of course, the RNL restaurant before that. This uh, modern facade is extremely distinctive, beloved. It's sort of a real part of the landscape there. This has been shrouded in a construction shed for several months, and a lot of people were worried. They didn't know what was going on behind it. People saw things being taken down. Um, you know, we knew that they had permission from the Landmarks Preservation Commission to do some restoration work, and some stuff was going to come down, and that's okay. And also, uh, you know, we knew this wasn't necessarily going to stay a luncheonette forever. It was going to turn into something else, and there might need to be some minor adjustments to it. That's okay as well. Um, it's funny because uh, people were very concerned because this was taken down and they thought this was going to be thrown in the, in the junk heap. Well, so it turns out it wasn't. This, everything from here on up is perfectly restored. The problem is this down here. Um, they basically replaced the entire um, storefront um, and part of that was done contrary to the Landmarks Preservation Commission approved. So we immediately reached out to the chair of the Landmarks Preservation Commission to alert her and to say, look, this guy didn't even do what you allowed him to do, although we took issue with what they allowed him to do and the way that they allowed him to do it. Some of this they did allow, and we're going to have to really push back with the commission to say, first of all, this was approved at staff level, which means it didn't go through that public hearing process. And the stuff that's approved at staff level is supposed to be really the most minor of things, things that are so small that uh, from the screen you can't see it, you're replacing something in kind, 
Um, it's up on the roof, and you know, you, you have to be on the roof itself to see it. This is very, very, very visible. And while some of this stuff, um, they didn't have permission to do other parts of it, they did, and so we're going to keep on the commission's case about that. Um, we've also been adding to our uh, historic, or historic image archive, which is this great collection of uh, old images of the neighborhood, everything from paintings to photographs to um, etchings. Um, and we are actually in the process of, so we launched this, uh, I guess, six or seven months ago now, um, and it's been really, really popular. Several different collections on there, last part of Washington's Park, um, you know, a lot of different great stuff on there. Um, we are in the process of adding to it now. It's a little scary, but so these are photos that I remember they're being taken, or they just preceded me being here at GDSHP, but they are now, in fact, a historic record of the neighborhood from surveys that we did in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, so especially the western part of our neighborhood. We're going to digitize these. They're already in the process of happening and put them up on our website. It's in the Meatpacking District. This is now the Diane von Furstenberg headquarters. It looks a little different now. Um, uh, this building is now where the Whitney now is, but I'm sure a lot of you remember this. Um, that's still there, although a lot different. So we're very excited that the things that we did in the last 15, 20 years, really just internally for our own surveys and advocacy, now we're going to turn into a publicly available uh, resource so that people can uh, see how different and in some cases how similar our uh, things are to just a couple of decades ago. Um, we've also been doing a lot of work with maps, um, and they seem to be a really handy uh, resource for people. So all of those historic images we put on a map here. So and this is all through our website. So you just go here, and if you're particularly interested in, you know, let's say uh, this area over here, or things around Washington Square Park, you just click on each one of these, and the historic image will pop up, and you can see uh, what's there. Um, similarly, we are now have a map that shows where our business of the months are, um, so we keep adding to that. That's another great way for people to engage around this. Um, and we've recently added a map that shows where all of our historic plaques are, which uh, we do about two of these a year, so it's a young program, but it's definitely uh, growing, so that's uh, a great resource. Um, this is our Kids Ed program, which uh, Sam is also in charge of. And Sam, we had a really big group of uh, students this summer through the Go Project, right? Do you know about how many students we served? We served about 80 through the Go Project, and then another 200 through an Educational Alliance um, summer program. That's great. So while most of our children's education program, which is done through schools throughout the city, uh, is during the school year, we actually do a lot of business, so to speak. Um, during the summer, although it's not really much of a business in the sense that um, more than 50% of the students who participate get to participate for free because we have a scholarship program. So any school that has any economic need, um, we make sure that they're able to participate. And to be perfectly honest, the schools that we do charge, it's really just sort of a placeholder fee. Um, it, makes it, uh, it, gives, it makes them a little more committed to make sure that they um, participate in it. Um, really, 90 or more percent of the funding for this program comes from our members and comes from um, foundations and public sources. Um, it's a really wonderful opportunity to sort of um, uh, teach the next generation of preservationists, or at the very least, um, to impart to children an understanding of how the built environment around them really reflects uh, history, and it's a wonderful place. Um, we've created a new uh, workbook for um, uh, our main program, and we're developing some new programs for our kids. And then just uh, one or two quick last things. Um, coming up, we have, uh, we did this last year, it was such a great success, we're doing it again. Um, a night will be in staff and trio at the uh, Eldridge Street Synagogue. It's not only this wonderful uh, music, um, uh, a really, really great musician, um, but you get to see the interior of the Eldridge Street Synagogue and Museum, which is a really, really amazing space through a guided tour. Um, and this is one of our few programs that we uh, charge for. It's a fundraiser. There's some expenses uh, attached to it. Um, but uh, if you're interested in either the music or the architecture, we definitely um, encourage you to uh, attend. It's now up on, as of today, up on our website. You can buy those tickets. Um, and we've just been doing a lot of outreach uh, out here in the neighborhood um, at street fairs, at um, uh, um, uh, food markets, things of that nature. So this was uh, Harry over the summer. And in the, on Saturday, there's two events coming up that we're going to be tabling at if you want to come by. Uh, Taste of the East Village on East 7th Street between Cooper Square and 2nd Avenue. 
and you're specifically going to have some stuff there for kids, is that right? Is um, and Astro Alive will have some things for kids. And that's the other one that's going to be uh, coming up on Saturday. Do you want to just briefly describe now what like the stuff we're going to have for kids? Sure. Just, uh, we're going to do a little bit of sidewalk chalk art, and we also have a, a, a crafts project uh, with brown paper bags to make row houses. <laughs> so if you're in either area, uh, pop by the uh, Astro Live News Brief, so just walk through, and that's the um, uh, event that's going to be celebrating the sort of unveiling and uh, opening of some of that stuff around the Astro Place uh, Square. So that is just a summary of what we've been up to for the last couple of weeks and what we think we're going to be up to for the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, and I'm really glad to be able to share it with you um, and to give you a little taste of what um, our hard working staff works on. And I also just want to mention we have a, a couple of our trustees here as well, Mary Ann Arisman, Judith Stone. Sixth Avenue on Houston Street, but they also chopped out that row of houses 
um, between McDougal and Sullivan. We fought very, very hard to try to get those in there. Um, so we were very disappointed about that. That said, they had originally chopped out some areas that we forced them to put in, such as the NYU Vanderbilt Hall building, which is on the south side of Washington Square, which is an entire city block um, between uh, Washington Square South, West Third, uh, McDougal, and uh, Sullivan Street. Is that right? Yes. Um, which uh, they could build a 300-foot tall tower there. Um, and because we've got landmarked, I'm pretty confident they will never build a 300 foot tall tower there. So, like you, I am unhappy with what has been torn down and what is supposed what's, to be built. What's going to go up there? It's going to be about a six or so story building. Um, so, bigger than the ones that are there and bigger than it should be because it also borders with Dubois Sullivan Gardens, but not crazy big, fortunately. They tore that building down so quickly. It was shocking. Basically, any property owner has the right to demolish their building as long as they do it with permits and safely, except if it is landmarked. And in this case, um, it was not landmarked, although, again, in 2008, the commission said it was eligible for landmarking, and then they uh, said it wasn't. Sir? Thank you, Andrew. Um, being at a several of these meetings, I've been on the Preservation Commission. I'm so shocked to see how anti preservation same 
application that also uh, led to the building that's being built on the corner there. Um, we had some pretty serious concerns about aspects of that um, uh, uh, application, and while change, some changes were made, but we thought more changes should have been made. And unfortunately, because of the um, apartment building on the corner, which got deservedly a huge amount of attention, and was sort of a real lightning rod, and was the one aspect of the proposal that the commission changed. We don't necessarily think they changed it for the better. They made it sort of a fatter building, um, but no smaller. Um, uh, unfortunately, other than us, very little attention was paid to the details of what the school is doing. Um, and uh, so uh, what you're going to see is some additions on top of that building that um, I think might not blend in as well as they could. They're going to be very yellow, if I remember correctly. Um, it's going to be about one or two stories on top. And with this, as with every other landmark application, you can go onto our website and you can actually look at all of the materials. We'll show you exactly what it is. So um, uh, if you were not able to find it yourself, just reach out to any of us and we'll send you a link directly and show you how to do it. But we want you and everyone else to be able to look at these things and say, I know exactly what's going on here. And that's what the things we put on our website are. Yes? Hi. Um, opposite that humongous building on, was it 12th and University place that's being built that we fought against. Opposite, all the storefronts, you know, like four are empty. Do you know if there are plans to, it's, it's just so odd to me that all of them close at the same time. Do you bring up the east side of University place? Yes. Between 12th and 13th. Right. Um, they, uh, I don't know. And because um, it's not landmarked, they wouldn't have to go through a public review right. process. Um, we got to talk to them. It's going to be a bank. Oh, no. Another bench. That's a cover off building, isn't it? Uh, the one in the middle. And the one that is on the floor. Yes, the floor. it's a co off. The, oh, the one that is putting the bank in. Uh -huh. Is it Gino? Is it a co off? Yes, yeah, across the street the from the couple. So the tent, the oldest one, the so we the, the dining was, and then it became the like uh, the yes. 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 Um, that's something that the city has been very uh, resistant to, uh, but it's definitely something that's high up on our agenda because it's a, it's a huge issue in terms of what really affects um, the way that it's going to feel. I have a similar question about the corner of McDougal and 8th Street. Going west on 8th from McDougal, there's like six or eight empty stores. It looks like someone is putting them together to do something rotten on that point. Do you have any light on what's been happening there? And it, it's been empty for a long time. Yeah. In that case, it is within the branch of the historic district. Right. So before anybody can do anything, um, we will know, you will know, it will have to go through a public review and approval process. But there's been no plans filed. I haven't heard any reliable intel on anything. Well, we have um, the over the base. Right, that's still there. The board of the big right. right. still there. Well, well, right. 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 Which is a good sign. Uh, but <laughs> doesn't, uh, you know, sort of meaning that at least at the moment they're not tearing down the building. Right. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, so at, at least because it's in a landmark district, it would have to go through that public review and approval process, which we would let everybody know about. But nothing's been filed but yet. But they could take their rights from somewhere else, for example, and build something bigger. If the Landmarks Preservation Commission would approve it. Well, it, it is, anything would be subject to the Landmarks Preservation Commission. You can't. So that's kind of thing possible. Well, uh, I, I would qualify that significantly, though, because two things. One is you can't really uh, transfer air rights around other than in those special circumstances like the ones that we described uh, there. So they would really only at a maximum be able to build as big as what the zoning allows. Um, the zoning for the, that area, if I'm not mistaken, doesn't allow uh, anything too huge. Um, I'd have to look and we could have a follow-up conversation about exactly what it would be. I would be hopeful, given how consistent the scale of the Street is, that the commission would not ever allow something that would be out of scale for that. Um, but this is all very hypothetical at the moment because nothing's been put 
but believe me, um, it would be uh, front and center to our attention um, as soon as something is uh, filed and we would certainly let the public know about it as well. Um, and that's the great thing about when something is landmark. You actually, at least you have a chance to engage it. You know what's coming. You can voice your opinion about it. You can try to convince somebody, yes, no, change, somewhere in between. Um, if it's not, they just get to do it without any of that process whatsoever. Um, any other questions? The movie, uh, the IFC Center on Sixth Avenue, uh, on the screen, you know, they show that they're expanding. They tell just in type, no pictures, uh, and they're going to have something like four uh, new uh, screening rooms. And uh, I'm unclear. I've heard this is rumors that they're going to build behind the movie house into Cornelia Street. Uh, is, isn't that landmarked? So, uh, yes, it is. And they have to go through two separate processes in order to be able to do what they're proposing to do. And they have gotten one set of approvals, but not the other. So uh, the other one, they still haven't gone through that process yet. And it remains to be seen what the outcome uh, would be. So they did get approval from the Landmarks Preservation Commission to build on the empty lot. And landmarking is never going to um, keep an empty lot an empty lot in perpetuity. Um, so that, that's not a surprise. Um, but the zoning uh, bumps up against what it is that they want to build, not so much in terms of the size, but in terms of the use. So they have to go for something called a zoning variance. Um, and we have a lot of information about this on our website. Um, it was heard at the community board, so it's gone through the community board process already, but it hasn't gone to the Board of Standards and Appeals, which is the, the body that ultimately makes the decision. That's usually a fairly long process. There's usually several hearings, um, and it's been taking a while for it to get there, I think partly because it's a very complicated uh, proposal. So the outcome there is not yet uh, determined, but we can have a follow-up conversation that can kind of do more information about it. Right. Business in New York points out that uh, they feel it's going to go through because uh, the, the head guy at AMC Theaters, which owns the theater, uh, was a contributor to the Big contributor to the mayor. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, they also said that if they don't get the attention, they're going to close. The chief threat on that was. Yeah. Uh, you know, they've certainly said that they feel that they need this in order to survive. Uh, but, you know, again, it remains to be seen. It's a process that still hasn't uh, been undertaken, to do so uh, we don't know exactly what the outcome will be. It's fairly rare that these things from the beginning stay un entirely unchanged, so, you know, uh, I would say stay tuned. Um, because it's 7.30, I'm going to shift us over to the sort of the final portion of the evening, which is to just mix, mingle, eat, drink, maybe step outside and certainly talk to anyone.